everybody, this is Amy from RaisingArrows.net and today I want to talk to you about how to make read aloud time more peaceful. Now we all kind of have a vision in our heads of what read aloud time is supposed to look like. Um, in my head it's kind of like a Mary Cassatt painting. There's a mom sitting in a floral chair next to a window and you can see out the window and it's beautiful with a green grass and a shady tree in the yard and she's got one child on the arm of the chair and the other child she's snuggling close to her and she's reading from this wonderful book and it's very quiet and calming and soothing she's dressed very neatly the children are dressed very neatly i am certain that there's the smell of lilacs in the air and there's a slight breeze from the window coming through and it's just it's just this beautiful picture of perfection in what a read aloud time ought to look like however my read aloud times look more like a bunch of kids piled on top of me some of them kick fighting, some of them bickering, some of them talking incessantly and asking questions that have nothing to do with the book. Um, the toddler's running through the house without her diaper and the baby's crying and yeah, it's, it's not peaceful at all. And I definitely don't have a picture window with a beautiful tree outside and it doesn't smell like lilacs. So I have this vision of what it's supposed to look like, but it never meets that expectation. And it'd be my guess that you might have the same situation going on and you're kind of wondering, how can I make read aloud time something that looks like a painting? Well, you can't. So let's just dispel that myth right now. You absolutely cannot have a read aloud time that looks like a painting unless, unless you have two children, only two children, and they're not toddlers and they're not babies and they don't have special needs and they're not human. Okay, so maybe they can be human, but that's even maybe an iffy question. So I would suggest to you that rather than seeing read aloud time as this beautiful painting that you have to, you know, rise to the occasion with, that you actually take a step back and lower your expectations and totally shift the paradigm of read aloud time on its head. Because I'm certain if you're watching this, you probably have tried read aloud time and it wasn't peaceful. Or you watched a YouTube video or you listened to a podcast or you read some blog post that made it look like it was a beautiful time and you were really hoping that I'm going to tell you the keys to making it look exactly like that. And I'm not. I'm actually going to tell you how to shift the way that you think about read aloud time and make it something that actually fits a more realistic lifestyle, especially if you're a mom of more than two humans. So let's get started. First of all, let's talk about your motivation. You need to think about what your motivation is for doing read aloud time. Did you go to a homeschool conference and some speaker there told you that without read aloud time, your children were going to be behind or delayed or not very smart or not very well rounded or maybe you heard some really inspirational blogger talk about it on some podcast and and you really want that for your family because you should read aloud to your kids if you have that as your motivation somebody else's expectations or what you think a good homeschool mom looks like as your expectation, you are going to fail every single time. You will never live up to those expectations because there's somebody else's. And more than likely that somebody else is giving you more of a generalized picture, not an everyday this is what it looks like picture. And so you think that's the only way to do it and really it's not. So you need to change your, your motivation. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, you need to think about why read aloud time is a good idea. And there can be a myriad of reasons why you're doing read aloud time. Maybe you want to introduce your kids to classics. Maybe you just want them to learn more vocabulary and so by reading aloud you introduce them to that. Maybe you are looking to supplement your history. Maybe you just want some time with your family and a read aloud sounds like a great way to do that. There are so many different reasons, but you need to own the reasons that are yours. 
whatever those may be, once you know what your motivation is for it, you realize then that you're not trying to aspire to look like a painting. You're aspiring to something much deeper, much meatier. So let's jump off from there. The other thing that I want to encourage you to not do is to not use read aloud time as discipline time. Now, maybe here and there you can use it as training ground to teach your toddler to sit quietly, but really don't make it always about the toddler sitting quietly or kids behaving a certain way. You want your children to love books. You want them to enjoy the read aloud time. You want them to learn the language and enjoy the way that the words flow. And if you're always on to them about their behavior, it's going to be a very bitter, resentful, ugly memory. I allow my kids to bring notebooks and pens and toys and all kinds of things as long as they're quiet to the place where we're reading aloud because I feel like if they can sit quietly drawing something or playing with a toy very quietly is not going to hinder the connection between the book and their brains. Almost always if I think they're not listening and I ask them a question, they absolutely know the answer. They are listening. They can multitask in that fashion where they are drawing a picture or they are playing with a toy in their hands. Sometimes some children actually do better if their hands are moving. Um, just a quick aside, I used to be a part of a quiz bowl team when I was in high school. And we always had gum or pretzels or something like that available to us when we were practicing and also when we were actually doing the questions because there is something about chewing while you're thinking that makes it more effective. And so that was something that we always did. So I'm okay with my kids having some sort of kinesthetic connection to their brains while they're listening to a read aloud. Boys are especially like this, and I have a lot of little boys, and so I'm not going to make them just sit there with nothing to do. They are allowed to bring their notebook and paper or a little toy. So that's just kind of an idea for you that it doesn't have to be them sitting quietly with nothing to do. Now, as far as like toddlers and babies, there are times when I have one of my older children hold the baby to help her to be calm and quiet while we're reading, or I'll wait till she's asleep. The toddler is often flitting in and out, and I'm okay with that too. Um, it's just a matter of letting go again of those expectations and not feeling like everybody has to be present and everybody has to be behaving a certain way. You will find yourself flustered and exhausted if you don't make some concessions and allow for things to be a little more relaxed and easygoing instead of a painting that's not even real. Okay, so what about where can you have read aloud time? Currently, our read aloud time is with me sitting on the fireplace and my kids sitting in this big U-shaped couch that we have in our living room. Most of the time, though, our read aloud time has been in some sort of living room setting, but read aloud time can literally be anywhere. We've done it at the dining room table. The kids are listening while they eat, or you can read before you eat and eat afterwards. Sometimes, like at lunchtime, I'm eating something different from my kids anyway. So I'll read aloud to them and eat a little bit later. You can also read on your front porch, on your back porch. You can read sitting on the floor. You can read sitting on a couch with the kids all over the place. You can read sitting outside on a blanket. We have a blanket that is like a travel blanket and it zips up and we keep it by the back door and it is waterproof and it doesn't pick up like grass. You can shake it out really easily and we just keep it by the back door so that we can take it right outside and lay it out and everybody can sit on it. And it's just a really great tool that we use, especially in the cooler days when it's nice to go outside and, and you can sit in the shade of a tree and just enjoy that time as a family. And you have that backyard area for the younger kids to just kind of wander off if they need to. They're, they're still catching some of what's going on and so it's fine if they wander off. So I say all that for you to understand that you don't need to have a floral chair beside a picture window with the kids cuddled up in your arms and it's smelling like lilacs for you to actually have an effective read aloud time. Next is the when. When is a good time to read aloud? 
any time, any time you can fit it in. If you have five minutes before you're headed somewhere, sit down and read a book. And if you only have a few of the kids beside you, it's okay, read a book. Don't feel like you always have to have everybody gathered up to read a book. Maybe if you're reading a longer book that's more involved, wait to do that until you have everybody there. But have a few books just sitting on the shelf that you can easily grab that you can read anytime to any group of kids that are there. And it's a short book and it, it's not something that's going to need several days to finish. It's just a, a quick little read. It's a perfect time to read aloud to your kids anytime that you have a little bit of extra time. You can read aloud to them in the car. I know somebody who has a little, one of those tape recorder things and it has the microphone with it and kind of has the speakers and I don't like Fisher Price makes them or something, but she holds that and reads a book to her kids in the van so that everybody can hear her. It's a really great tool. It's not something I've tried, but I imagine if you have some sort of Bluetooth situation or USB in your vehicle, you could try that too with some sort of microphone setup. I've never tried it, but I think it would work. So that's an idea as well. Um, you can read it in the doctor's office and just little snippets of time, just read real quietly to your kids, but just enjoy seizing those moments when you have just a little bit of time where you can read to them. And then when you have a bigger amount of time, do that too. For us, we are currently doing read aloud time in the morning. And I know a lot of people do something called a morning basket and that's kind of the idea here. So I call everybody to school and I'm sitting on the fireplace and the kids are in this U-shaped couch and I read to them from the books that are in the basket. So it's a child story Bible. Currently we're reading Grandpa's Box and we just finished the mix up File, mixed up files of Mrs. Basilie Frankweiler. So I think we're going to be doing maybe Understood Betsy. I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet where we're going to go with the next read aloud, but the kids are already asking, what's our next read aloud? So I need to figure it out pretty soon. But that's what we do in the morning. Before school starts, that's our schedule, our routine. I also have afternoon read aloud, read aloud time, and that goes with our Tapestry of Grace curriculum. So if there are history books or other literature books that I want to read at that time, or maybe there's some music or art, something like that that's in the Tapestry of Grace curriculum, that's typically where that falls. And then many years we have had an evening read aloud time. Currently we are not doing that and that's because I'm in a season with a baby who needs me at that time frame. So I imagine as she gets older we will go back to an evening read aloud but I'm not sure. But I have very fond memories of our evening read aloud several years ago. Um, one of the ones that really sticks out in my mind is The Long Winter by Laura Ingalls Wilder and it was this freezing cold winter and we felt like we were there because it was a particularly cold winter that year and we all remember sitting in the living room the kids were on the couch and i was in my chair and we could hear the wind howling behind us through the window as i was reading about this freezing cold winter and it was just magical to almost feel like you were there so we've had a myriad of read aloud times and, and I try to fit them in whenever I can. And I will also find that my older girls especially will pick up library books that I have grabbed and they will just read them to the little kids at times. And um, they're, they're little kid books, but they'll read them aloud and um, tell me how much they enjoy them. So make sure you have books available. We have a pretty extensive family library, but I do still go to the library as well. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. Okay, so what should you read aloud? This is a question I get fairly often. What are some book lists? What are some ideas for reading aloud to my kids? And one that gets asked a lot is when you have multiple ages. So for instance, I have a baby who's eight months old and then I have a 19 year old. And so let's just take the 19 year old out of the equation because he's in college. So I have up to a 16 year old in school currently. So how do I engage? all those ages in one read aloud. Well, the truth is you can't. You cannot pick a book that's going to span all those ages. It just isn't possible. So what I have personally done is I choose kind of a middle of the road. So fourth, fifth, sixth grade reading, um, we're talking like boxcar children. 
somewhere around that age level. I think boxcar children might be third grade, considered third grade. But anyway, my kids enjoy boxcar children. But the truth of the matter is you don't need to have a book that spans all those ages. You can read anything to your children. Read to them from Dr. Seuss. Read to them from the Bible. Read to them from the newspaper. Read to them from something you've found on the internet. Read to them from coffee pot manuals. You know, when I was a kid, I used to get in the tractor with my dad and ride around and I would read tractor manuals. That's what I would do. I had no clue what they said, but I was reading it. And that's what you want your children to aspire to, not necessarily reading tractor manuals, but being willing to pick up anything and read it and to just engage with the text. So as you're driving by road signs, read them. Read aloud to your kids in every instance. We go to museums a lot, and one of our favorite museums is a space museum in Kansas called the Cosmosphere. And we will go there and all of our kids go with us. And most of them are not of an age where they understand a lot of what is being said on the plaques and the signs there. But we still go ahead and read them. And we still encourage them to read them for themselves as soon as they are able. Now they don't read everything and neither do we, but they are, every time they go, they're getting more and more information and then they can relate it to other things. So anytime you go to a museum, Read the plaques aloud to your kids. Read as much as you can. Engage them as much as you can. You don't need to read everything, and they don't need to get the entire picture to get something out of it. I remember Marcia Somerville, who wrote Tapestry of Grace, saying in a session that I was in at a homeschool conference that up until about seventh grade, 13-ish, you could literally throw out a index cards with all different time frames on them and kids wouldn't really be able to tell that they needed to go in a certain order. And then once they got to about 13, chronology made sense to them. I kind of feel like that's the same way with history. They don't necessarily need to have a chronological history curriculum. I like it. I like to see history in progression. But until kids are a certain age, they don't really understand that. So if you are going through a museum or you're reading a really literature-rich, thick vocabulary text, they're not going to get everything. But that's okay. They're going to get something. And then as they get older, they're going to connect the dots. And that's what you want. It doesn't need to be they get everything all at once. This is just kind of a continuing to introduce them to language. Now, if you'd like some suggestions of what kind of books to actually read to your kids, there are some great resources out there. First of all is this little book. Let's see if I can get it here. Okay, Honey for a Child's Heart. This is by Gladys Hunt. This is an older book, but it is a book full of book lists. And she just has them by um, age and author and then she tells about why like the theory behind why you should read aloud to your kids so it's it's really not a huge book but it's a very good read and it's a good resource for you to have another one is a book called all through the ages by christine miller and this is it here let's see if i can there um, by Christine Miller. I'm thinking this might be out of print, but I'm not sure. And I will, I will find a link and put it down in the notes. But this book is fantastic. And if you can get your hands on a copy, this is really helpful, especially if you're looking for something to supplement your history with. She goes through lots of different historical timelines and she has things labeled by, um, let's see, let's go this way. Labeled by age, specific events, um, things that have happened, historical fiction, literature. So she has everything labeled for you so that say you are studying history chron chronologically and you want to supplement with some books, you can go and find that age here and look for some books that are age appropriate. Or you can even use this curriculum or this, I'm sorry, you can even use this book to write your own curriculum. If you just take the suggestions that she has and you use them as the backbone of your history curriculum and read completely living books to them, this is a this is a fantastic resource for that. Another thing that I have been doing recently 
is I copied off the reading list and I have every single one here and I just I just stapled them together that came from Not Consumed. This is a completely free resource. It's in her homeschool package and I will link to that as well. It's a free resource. She's got lots of things in there, but this particular reading list is in there as well and it goes first through eighth grade. And I just printed it off and I stapled it together and I take it to the library with me. And I pick, I'm just starting at the top, and I pick like the first six books and I get those at the library if I can and I bring those home to the kids and they you know read through them throughout the next two weeks before I take them back and go and get the next batch. You can also look for uh, reading lists online. So AmblesideOnline.org is a Charlotte Mason free curriculum. It has book lists by age on there. Pinterest has some great book lists. There are lots of bloggers who've put together book lists. So if you want to look online, that's another great resource to find specific book lists for your child. But don't hesitate to take those book lists and use them for multiple ages. I have found that my older children enjoy little kid books just as much as the little kids do. I enjoy them just as much. For instance, my daughter just came, my 16 year old, just came up to me today with a book that I had picked up from this list. It was Stand Tall, Molly Lou Mellon. I'd never heard of it. She'd never heard of it. She said, Mom, this is such a cute book. She had sat down and read it. And I imagine she also read it aloud to whoever was nearby. So that is the beauty of good books because they're going to stand the test of time and they're going to be something that a wide age range is going to enjoy. So don't worry about keeping within, you know, your age group. If you're a homeschooler, you know, we don't do that anyway. So don't don't be confined to that. Just read. Read aloud from whatever you can find. And you will find that those read alouds become conversations. They're jumping off points for conversations. And so my final point I want to make with that whole conversation in mind is that if you are a homeschool parent, get a literature rich curriculum. If this is important to you, get a literature rich curriculum. For us, that's Tapestry of Grace. For some families, that's Sunlight. There's Heart of Dakota, anything Charlotte Mason. Five in a row is fantastic. We've used five in a row with our little kids. And just to tell you a little bit about it, there's one book per week. You read the book several times throughout the week where the kids get to the point where they can almost recite it, which is really cool. And all of the activities for that week revolve around that book. You can pick and choose from any of the activities. You don't have to do all of them. And you don't have to do one every day. You can do several one day and skip a day, and whatever. It's not a set Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday curriculum. It really can be um, set to your own rhythm and your own family's needs. So that's a really great option for the younger grades. But for us, Tapestry of Grace has been what we have used all through the ages with our kids. I do prefer it mostly for the probably fourth grade and up crowd is my favorite to use it with. It gets really meaty and really fun at that age. So those are just some ideas for you for literature rich curriculum. You will find that you are reading a very diverse group of books. Um, lots of different genres, lots of different tones and voices and authors. And that the more that you can expose your children to lots of different books, the better the vo their vocabulary is going to be and the more big ideas they will have in their little brains to converse about. Their conversations will come up all the time in our family where something we have read, there is something that relates to it on down the road and those connections are made. So that is fantastic. And to me, that's really what I want out of read aloud time. I want memories and I want those connections. Now, let me talk here at the end about those memories. I told you about the Little House on the Prairie book, The Long Winter, and how the wind was howling and I have such fond memories of that. I can guarantee you that the real story behind that read aloud time was probably there was a toddler being crazy and a baby crying and the kids weren't listening the entire time and somebody had to go to the bathroom and you know probably there was a lot of things going on but in my mind with rose colored glasses several years later it was beautiful. 
I am sure that we were sipping hot cocoa with many marshmallows and it smelled of cinnamon and evergreen and we were listening to the howling wind and it was a beautiful evening and everyone went to bed so nicely that night and just fell fast asleep dreaming of sugar plums. Although I can tell you that's probably not really the truth. In fact, I know it's not the truth. Just not the way things are. But as time progresses, you forget all the craziness. And if you have memories that don't have these lofty expectations, you actually will find that the things that you remember about read aloud time are really the beautiful things. You kind of forget all the chaos and the clutter and the craziness. You only remember the beautiful stuff that's left over. So I hope that you pick a book this week and you start reading aloud to your kids. And if you can only read for three minutes before the crazy starts, it's three minutes you got to read to them. Pick it up again next time. Make sure you don't end it with a huff, like you just can't stand the fact that you had to quit because they were being naughty. Just kind of you know, slowly fade out and be done for then. And no big deal. We'll pick it up tomorrow. I think you will find that your children get more and more stamina with read aloud time. And they get to the point where they want you to read one more chapter, mommy. And that is very cool.